Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for coming out on a beautiful August evening to chat here. Um, who's new to Open Forum? Okay, awesome. Great, welcome. My name is Dr. Hunter Peterson, and I am a naturopathic physician and the clinic director of Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. Uh, we have a clinic just downtown here. So, um, the Open Forum is a monthly conversation, dialogue about all things related health. Um, it's an opportunity to bring questions that you have in any scope or context, and we will take the time to discuss them and chat about them. It's also um, a kind of monthly thing where I prepare a topic to talk about. Um, so. I don't have any PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be, as I said, a conversation. So I encourage you to raise your hand, interrupt me. Let's take the conversation in the direction that you want to take it. Um, I will be recording our conversation today. So if anyone wants to grab that recording, it is on our website, CoeurdelineHealingArts.com. And we have information about our clinic in the back if you want to learn more, if you're not a patient. So if you think a friend could really benefit from this info, feel free to share it. Um, we also have a little sign-up sheet I'm just going to pass around it basically uh, to learn about just events, community outreach we do, so if you want to stay connected with our listserv, we do send out opportunities, um, detox classes, open forum, homeopathy classes, etc., etc., so I'll just pass that around. Um, I like to start the class first by um, asking if anybody has any generalized health questions they want to discuss today, um, in which case, I'm going to write them down so we don't forget them, and at the end of the you know, formal lecture period, we'll come back to it. Um, so, who wants to start us off? Gina. Yeah. I have a, I'm curious um, what you think about the idea of consuming sulfur. And I have been exposed to the idea of MSM, and also the sulforaphane that's in um, cruciferous vegetables. So just kind of that topic. Okay. And you know what what health implications might be. Of yeah, MSM? and also um, I experienced some side effects when I used MSM. And yeah. also I heard that with uh, broccoli sprouts you have to chew them like crazy to okay. get. So you know just kind of that general. Okay. Topic. Yeah. Happy to chat about that. Yeah, Jack. Hey, welcome back, by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, I was curious your thoughts on grounding and if you think there's any validity to it and all that. I mean, yes, absolutely, but I'll talk more about okay. it. <laughs> or earthing is also another term for it. The fan back here is making it a bit harder oh, to Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it clips on and off. I'll project better. Thanks, man. Yes. I did the cleanse, the group cleanse in the spring, and you yeah. talked a lot about um, the heat right and low time right? Yes. So once I came off the cleanse, I started doing that. And I wonder if you could elaborate on <coughs> what is the whole thing about secretor status? Yeah. Can you I'll, explain that? Yeah, I'll touch on secretor status for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, that'll be blended into the lecture, actually. Stabilized oxygen. Okay. Um, in in what way would it be consumed? Like in food or oh, encapsulated? Putting, putting drops in water, drinking water. With okay. Drops in it, like okay. Three to five drops. Okay. Uh huh. I'll just have to change the volume of my voice when that clicks on. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. I 
don't have a lot of experience or knowledge of that. I mean, I know very specific foods that have hormonal properties, but I don't know if I can speak to that. I would love you to share more resources with me, maybe shoot an email over. Okay. About yeah. where I'm seeing it at? Yeah, yeah. And I can learn about it more. Yes? Just want to confirm you were planning to discuss food sensitivities tonight in your Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's a major Good. part of it, as, as is the, the blood type, you know, validity and where that comes from. So. Okay, so my question would be around the MTHFR gene uh, mutation. Is that something that's too broad that can be addressed in this forum? Um, you know, methylation and food sensitivities don't have a lot of, you know, clinical crossover in my experience. I, there may be some degree of that, but at the level of digestive physiology, there's not a ton of interplay there. So now, breakdown products of food, of course, very much affiliated potentially with methylation. So I could touch on that. Um, are you wanting to learn about it, how it relates to food sensitivities? I'm wondering if there is a connection or yeah. homocysteine, if there's any yeah. high homocysteine. Which yeah. Cer certainly, yeah. homocysteine in the bloodstream, it's in tissues has a, a concern. I, I wouldn't tie that. I mean, you could say that you could increase homocysteine by eating poorly, um, but in terms of MTHFR, that gene mutation and how that relates to food sensitivities, I, I don't know of very significant scientific connectivity. Um, great to consult the, the archives on our website because there's a whole lecture on that too. Oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. okay. I am coming in for an appointment, but um, okay. so sleep, ah. huge topic, and I do actually know a lot, but yep. I and I don't want to do anything hormone oriented like trip. Something else I was looking at. I've, I've used Com's Forte, yeah. you know, for years, and um, I think it's sometimes I think it's still effective. But I'm I'm wanting some other options, and I've heard of for years Valerian Root. I just kind of don't want to go out there and start flailing around. But if it's a simple, I, I you know, um, only in the supplement is what I'm looking for for tonight. Okay. You know, all the other stuff I'm. I'll either talk to you about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I can share some of my favorite directions to go. Okay, what else? <coughs> yes, Jay. Where did you get your shirt? This? Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I got it at Zara. Oh, so Yeah, it's for good. tall, skinny people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zara. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions for tonight? So, it's really going to be challenging to fit this all in because <clears throat> this is something I, I love to talk about. Um, and I probably bit off more than I can chew here. No pun intended. Um, so, I guess what I want to do today is I want to talk about food, al food allergies, food sensitivities, how we can test for them, how we work them up, and then how we treat them. 
um, as a kind of centerpiece of our conversation. But I think it's so critical to talk about the intestinal system, the gastrointestinal system, um, both in its healthy state and in its pathological state in order to better understand what a food allergy and a food sensitivity is and therefore how to test for them and treat them. So I thought we could start out by this, I don't know what maybe people are seeing in that picture, but what that's supposed to be is an example of a very crude example of the intestinal system. And I just wanted to kind of do some sort of visual because most people are visual. So I kind of want to take you on a journey of digestive physiology. Um, now, um, I guess personally, you know, I relate to this as a naturopathic physician because I really do feel the intestinal system is kind of the seat of health. Um, ultimately, everything flows from what we digest and assimilate. So if that function is deranged, it's very difficult to work on downstream issues. Um, you know, be that headaches or joint issues or menstrual irregularities or allergies or sinusitis. I mean, if we don't really tackle the healing of the gut and optimizing digestion absorption, then we're really going to be limited in how we can tackle other symptoms. And many symptoms I find, if not most, uh, physical plain symptoms kind of originate from um, issues in the gut. So. It's, it's really central to my practice with every single patient that I work with. I have a you know major personal health background in relation to all my um, kind of, uh, I, I guess, um, cavalier world traveling I did when younger and eating things I shouldn't have and dealing with my own gut issues. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something cool to learn about. And I feel like with my training as a naturopathic physician and my area of interest is just something um, that's great for us to all know more about. So, um, this picture represents the major organs of digestion, and I kind of want to walk through that. I think that um, first, it's kind of worth talking about how long it takes to actually digest the food we eat. Um, once we eat food, we chew it, drops into our stomach, that's pretty immediate. S spends about 45 minutes in the stomach, 45 minutes to an hour, after which it's shuttled into the small intestines, where it spends anywhere from three to six hours. And then finally ends up in the large intestine, where it spends anywhere from uh, probably 12 to 20 hours in a, in a healthy gut, um, and then is eliminated. Uh, so it's, you know, about a really almost a 24-hour process from start to finish. And actually, one of the ways you can measure that in terms of a, a methodology to test, it's called a transit time. You can swallow activated charcoal or eat a lot of beets. And you can actually measure how long it takes from the food to start from the beginning to the end based on where it shows in your stool. Healthy transit time is anywhere between about 18 hours and 36 hours. So if it's shorter than that, it's hypermotility, uh, meaning things are moving too quickly. And most commonly, it's longer than that for a lot of people, which is a sign of maldigestion and digestive uh, dysregulation. Um, so where we start is, of course, in the mouth, number one, those little teeth I drew. And this is actually a really important part of digestion, right? Um, what we're, we're accomplishing two big purposes there. Um, we are, in our saliva, releasing a tremendous number of digestive enzymes that are related to carbohydrates. Um, so if you chew on a piece of dough uh, for a long time, you'll notice it starts to taste sweet because you're actually breaking that down into sugar. So again, when we don't chew our food well, we're missing about arguably 50% of carbohydrate digestion. Um, the other major purpose it serves is that we expand the surface area of our food, right? So chewing something from solid into liquid amplifies the surface area times several orders of magnitude. So this is really critical for good digestion because we need enzymes to be able to access that food better. Um, so we start in the mouth and then we swallow through the esophagus, which is first voluntary muscle, right? When we intentionally swallow, but then it moves into involuntary muscle 
that shuttles the food down to the stomach. <clears throat> There's a little valve at the top there called the lower esophageal sphincter that opens for food and water, and then it drops into the stomach. Um, a lot of people with dysfunction in that valve get what's called heartburn or reflux. And there's a lot of things that cause that, but there's a dysfunction with that valve in the stomach. Um, the stomach is the place where we have a highly acidic environment. So the pH of the blood is 7.4, it's neutral, or water is the same, it's neutral. The stomach's pH is 1 or 2. So it's, it's, uh, it's acidic enough to actually digest your tooth in about 24 hours. That's you know, the strongest bone in your body. So it's, it's a really hostile environment um, for microbes, which is a good thing, because it's a place where we also prevent pathogens from getting into the rest of our intestinal system. But its main digestive function is to um, break down proteins into smaller pieces, and it does that through secreting hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So those are triggered when food drops into the stomach, and we start to uh, break apart those compounds. We also start to gain access to some of the minerals in the food we're eating as well as some of the vitamins, particularly vitamin B12. Um, a lot of individuals can have issues with either too much stomach acid but more often too little. Um, that is a very significant clinical issue that comes up. So after it washes around in the stomach for about an hour, it gets dumped into the upper portion of the small intestine called the duodenum. And that small intestine, just to give you guys some perspective, is about uh, 20 or 22 feet long. And even more amazing about the small intestine is if you spread the surface area of the small intestine out, of one adult small intestine, it would cover the size of a football field. So why that is, is because the small intestine's main job is one of absorption. So the more the surface are absorbed to surface, the more efficiently we can bring nutrients into the body. So there's what are these little finger-like projections called microvilli carpeting that mucosal lining to help really enhance absorptive capacity. That also happens to be a place where a lot of pathologies develop is that mucosal lining. So, when the food enters the small intestine, it, uh, the acid from the stomach actually triggers some other organs of digestion to emit their secretory uh, juices, the, the things that actually break down and digest our foods. So those are numbers um, five, six, and seven, the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. <clears throat> so the liver has all sorts of functions for the human body. We are gonna speak more specifically to what's called their exocrine function, which is meaning secreting things into the intestinal um, tract. Um, so what the liver is ultimately responsible for is uh, the creation of bile, which is both a means of elimination of toxins from the body, as well as a way to help us absorb our fats. So it's how we you know, kind of make soap bubbles around our fats and bring them into the bloodstream. And the gallbladder is really just a storage tank for the bile that the liver is making so that we can actually squeeze that bile out in a significant quantity when a meal hits the small intestine. Otherwise, that liver would just be dripping bile into the small intestine and we wouldn't really get a large amount when we actually need it. Um, so it's a very important organ. Just taking out the gallbladder is not a good idea because then we have issues with fat absorption. Uh, when we don't have that concentrated bile in the intestines at the right time. You answered it. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the pancreas is, um, again, has endocrine function. It makes insulin and glucagon, which are related to blood sugar and many other things. But its exocrine function is its main purpose, and it's what creates most of our digestive juices. So the enzymes that break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates all mostly come from the pancreas. So again, based on different signals from the brain and from the stomach, when food hits the small intestine, the pancreas squirts out a bunch of these digestive juices to help break down the food. So once everything's in the mix in the duodenum, it passes into the jejunum and ileum. They're just different portions of the small intestine. 
And in those spaces, we are, absor we are breaking down our food into absorbable quantities that can pass that mucosal lining. And we are also absorbing most of our water in the small intestine. Now, a lot more is going on there. Um, I think it's really important to mention um, the microbiome in relation to the small intestine and the colon. These are the microbes that live in our gut. There are a hundred times more of them in our small and large intestines than there are cells in our body, to give you some perspective. Um, so trillions and trillions of organisms live there, and they have incredibly, massively important roles to play, not just with digestion, but with human health in general. And there are thousands of different species of microbes, bacteria, yeast, parasites, uh, fungus, you know, all different, primarily bacteria though that live there. And there can be what are called commensal or friendly organisms. There can be called what are opportunistic organisms in which um, organisms that if they get out of balance can cause problems if you get too much of them. And then there's organisms called um, pathological, which are organisms that you never want to be there. And in someone with a compromised system, those can arise. So those bacteria actually play a central role both in digestion or food breakdown as well as assimilation. For example, the cells that line the intestinal mucosa, what I was telling you, those finger-like cells, they actually rely primarily on the bacteria in the gut to provide their nutrition. And those bacteria, just like we are benefiting from the food we consume, the bacteria are taking a passive at it as well. So the most prominent force shaping which bacteria are there are, of course, what we eat, which is you know, really significant to understand more broadly. Um, there's also all sorts of different cell types in the intestinal lining. There's immune cells. Um, so it, it's, it's this very complex system that I'm just scratching the surface of, but for the sake of not confusing everybody, I, I want to give a basic um, platform to understand. So finally, after we get through those 20 feet of small intestine, we end in the large intestine or the colon, which uh, is about three or four feet long. It's, um, it's larger, as you can see, it's number eight. It's larger in terms of diameter, and it has a lot more bacteria in it. It has like three pounds of bacteria in it as an adult. So three pounds of us is just the bacteria in your colon. And largely what happens in the colon is um, this is where the remainder of water absorption happens. Some of our, a very select few of our vitamins and minerals are absorbed there and actually created by the colon flora. That's part of the conversion process. Um, and basically it's, it's, a, it's a place to condense, you know, the waste products, the fiber that is not been absorbed, etc., cetera, into, um, into a stool that we eliminate then. Um, so that's a real quick and dirty overview of digestive physiology. Um, any questions about digestive physiology in a healthy state? Yeah. Just a quick question about the pancreas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in someone who has type 1 diabetes and their body is not producing insulin, yeah. I'm assuming that the pancreas then is still producing the Correct. enzymes to do that. Yeah. It's just the insulin that's... Yeah, it's the insulin. Those are called the endocrine elements of the pancreas, which is a relatively small component of it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? You may get to this, um, the obvious effect when the mucosa, the lining is permeable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's let's kind of launch over to, well, what, what can go wrong in the gut? And a lot, um, we're going to touch on a few things. Um, we talked about some of the upper stuff, right? We talked about reflux when that upper valve is dysfunctional and we're splashing hydrochloric acid up into the esophagus where it's not supposed to be. That can create a lot of issues for people. Um, the lining of the stomach can uh, get inflamed and irritated. It's a term called gastritis. If that gets really progressive, it actually turns into something called um, something called uh, ulceration. 
So it's a deeper pathology of that. Um, when we get into the small intestine, which is primarily what we'll focus on today, um, as someone just mentioned, um, it's, it's very much a, uh, the pathologies that happen in the small intestines are a spectrum. So, you know, you can go anywhere from getting mild bloating or discomfort to happen on occasion to having what's called, you know, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, these very deep, intense, um, you know, life-threatening pathologies. And it, a lot has to do with the relationship between the gut flora, the food we eat, and the health of the intestinal lining, and the output of the organs of digestion. All of them can be impacted. Um, so when we're, we're dealing with something like bloating and gas and you know, discomfort, um, likely what's happening is you have an imbalance of some of the microorganisms there. Um, you have some opportunistic species thriving. They're creating toxins. Um, some of the foods you were eating are not digesting appropriately and they're fermenting in the gut. And over time, especially if that's very frequent and repetitive, it leads to eventual dysfunction of those cells that line the mucosal membrane of the gut. If that happens again on a persistent basis, what will actually go on is those cells will degenerate and die. And then you start to get gaps between this nice thick carpeting that's supposed to be there. And um, things start to seep into the bloodstream that aren't fully digested food-wise. And also toxins from the microbes in our gut actually start to leak into the bloodstream as well. Um, and that can downstream cause a lot of consequences in other organs and tissues in the body totally unrelated to digestion. So a lot of times when we're dealing with a migraine headache or with uh, arthritis or with you know, uh, seasonal allergies, that's actually what we're really dealing with at its root cause. Uh, but they've migrated then into different organs and tissues. So what that degeneration can have happen is it obviously can become more exacerbated and more, um, more pathological, and then we develop deeper states of intestinal dysfunction and therefore symptoms and pathology. Um, there's a lot of different terms we can use. We, you know, I use the term leaky gut to describe that. Um, that's essentially that intestinal hyperpermeability. Um, there's also a term IBS, which is kind of a catch-all term many of you have heard. Often it is associated with or features a combination of either diarrhea or constipation. Um, there's also what's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's another iteration of the same type of pathologies, but the idea there is that you have way too many of certain opportunistic species in the small intestine, and that's creating all sorts of intestinal dysfunction, basically. Um, I think outside of that, you know, colonically, we can talk about constipation, diarrhea, loose stool. These are all, again, in various gradations. A lot of different causes for that in different people. Part of it can be a bug issue, an imbalance of the flora. Part of it can be a lack of fiber. Um, part of it can be stress. Um, and we're going to touch more on, you know, I, I think right now maybe is a good time to talk about how, even though we're going to be heavy focused in on food here today and how to understand and assess for food intolerances and allergies, in my experience, um, the <coughs> physiological manifestations of stress are massively influential over the quality of digestion and um, one's intestinal health. So there's a concept called fight or flight, right? Also clinically known as sympathetic dominance. And this is a concept that when evolutionarily, if we needed to run from a tiger or a lion to save our lives, our body didn't need to be focusing on certain things like reproduction and digestion, right? Well. Turns out that in our, and that obviously adaptively had a very useful physiological purpose to redirect our 
blood flow and our nerve supply to our brain and our skeletal muscles. However, in our current culture and society, we see the majority of adults that I see are in a constant state of fight or flight to some degree. Consequently, they are in a constant state of shutdown of the blood flow and nerve supply to the organs of digestion. So breakdown and assimilation require good innervation and blood supply. If those aren't there, regardless of how perfectly you eat, you're going to have intestinal issues that develop. Yes, Jake? Ah, what do you do? <laughs> well, and again, I mean, what, what you do about that is a little beyond the scope of today's conversation. Okay. I actually did a couple of different lectures on open forums on the physiology of stress and, you know, spoke about tools to engage that. Um, and that's, you know, really, it's, it's a really personalized conversation for each person because what creates stress and how each of us respond to stress is a very individual conversation typically although there's all sorts of great tools like foundational things like exercise and mindfulness and faith um, and uh, quality time with family and friends um, you know sleep uh, so many things tie into that but it's just really important to bring that up right because if we just think well I'm gonna go do all these tests and figure out what foods are the best for me and I'm not getting better Probably something to think of there is what role does that have to play? Um, the other thing that I think is important to mention that I think is almost a every single new patient visit conversation is the concept of food hygiene. And it ties into the fight or flight thing and it ties into the, the number one organ, which is the mouth, right? The, the chewing. A lot of people don't chew their food and consequence, consequently a lot of downstream digestive issues manifest from that. A lot of people also eat in a hurry and are stressed and, you know, don't prepare their own food, right? This is all shutting down the organs of digestion. It's not good. Um, you make about 30% of your digestive enzymes when you smell the food as you prepare it. So if you, you know, get something fast food or whatever, you're missing 30% of digestion just right there. Um, similarly, if you drink lots of fluids with your meals, you're diluting your digestive enzymes. Don't want to do that, right? Because we want those concentrated, so minimal fluid intake as well with meals. Um, so, any kind of questions about those pieces? Um, sparkling water. Yeah. How does that affect that? Yeah, good question. Um, sparkling <laughs> water, it depends on how much acid you have in your stomach, but the challenge with it is it's very alkaline. And while we want the blood to be slightly alkaline, we don't want the stomach to be alkaline, generally speaking. So it can dilute the acidity of the stomach, which can become problematic for digestion, especially with people who are A blood types that are already predisposed to having very low stomach acid, at least clinically in my experience. Um, so I would say in between meals, much less of an issue, but ideally minimized with meals. I have a mini side question about the fight or flight thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it's supposed to make you either fight or flight, what happens, what's happening when you can't do either and you just freeze? What is happening with that? Well, the same physiological action is happening in, in terms of what the nervous system is projecting. Can you restate the question? Yeah, she's asking if, if you're not fighting or flying which is the case for most people, you know, in chronic sympathetic dominance, what's happening in the body. All the same physiological reactions of fighting or flighting, it's just that it's maybe a little bit more subdued, um, but still is all, all taking place. So it, it doesn't change it, the fact that you're acting on the fight or flight reflex. You're it's, still taking a toll on your adrenal. Yeah, and all the systems impacted by it, right. Isn't it the sympathetic and the parasympathetic? Yeah, parasympathetic is that the term is the opposing state of your neurological system. It's also known, you know, in common terms as rest and digest. Okay. There's a reason for that, right? I mean, so, because that's where digestion is really optimized. So, 
you know, I can jump into a couple of treatments. From a treatment standpoint, we focus a lot on how to improve innervation and blood flow to the gut. So one of the things we'll teach is how to do diaphragmatic breathing because deep belly breathing activates all the nervous plexi associated with bringing blood flow and nerve supply to the gut. Um, so that's a great practice. And if you have a spasmed diaphragm, that can really be a problem for digestion. Um, secondarily, I'm a huge fan of the oil, castor oil, to be applied topically because it acts as a counter irritant and it stimulates the nerves and lymphatics and blood flow to engage with the organs of digestion. You can be a, apply castor oil across the entire abdomen, ideally with saturating a cotton flannel with it, and then apply heat over that. And it's probably the single most you know, uh, useful digestive tonic there is for someone with intestinal issues, especially when the nerve and blood flow issue is a big problem. And using that for a couple hours, a few nights a week, could often be very helpful. Um, so, those are just a couple of thoughts related to that topic. Um, I want to pause a sec for questions <laughs> based on where we're at right now. Um, anything before I move forward? Hi, hey, Jamie. Is the deep breathing stuff in the supple leopard book? I would imagine it is. Yeah, just diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. Any good yoga instructor will teach that as well. Um, certainly, I, we have handouts at the clinic too. and. Um, there's a really good app called Headspace um, that I just love. It's so well guided. It's a really great introduction into how to turn your awareness from your busy mind toward your breath. And does it matter whether the castor oil is hexane-free? Ideally, it would be hexane-free if that's possible. So I'm not sure. I usually recommend the organic castor oil from Think it as yeah. Yeah. Where exactly does that pad lie? What's the, the best place? Um, from the bra line down to the uh, top of the hip bones so is the, the coverage. Whole, this whole section. Yeah. So it's then a, the, cover all the organs of digestion. Okay, so that cotton flannel needs to be pretty size. open. Yeah, you want to open it up pretty well. Okay. Yeah. I'm doing it wrong. Okay. Well, I'm glad, <laughs> oh, glad, glad we chatted about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Is, ideally, is that the, the same type of thing they did like um, back when I was younger when you had problems with constipation, they had to take a warm bath? Uh, it's a little different mechanism there, okay. um, but certainly heat um, okay. brings blood flow okay. to the organs of digestion, so in a sense it could help improve constipation in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So, um, you know, some other things just to quickly point out, how do we get to a leaky gut? How do we get to another term for imbalanced flora is dysbiosis. Um, how do we get there? Well, we talked about stress. Obviously, food has a huge, huge amount to do with it. Just speaking to food, probably the biggest offenders in my experience are um, processed carbohydrate, meaning grains, or starchy vegetables like potato and corn that have been processed, right? They basically turn instantly into sugar. Sugars themselves or sweetened beverages, that includes alcohol, I put in that category. Um, and cow dairy, I find to be real problematic for a lot of people. Um, and we'll talk more about that in relation to allergy and sensitivity. Um, additionally, some things to really be aware of is the effect of antibiotic use on the gut, um, right? Antibiotics are not specific to the bug that's in your ear or in your sinuses, right? They're going in and they're wiping out everything, and that includes the healthy flora in your gut. So that can really predispose someone to developing an intestinal pathology. Um, certainly toxins in our food has that potential too, so, you know, um, pesticide-laden foods, GMO foods, um, metals contained in our foods, food quality ends up being a big deal. Um, and I would also say, you know, there's microbes that can get into our gut, right? So we can get parasites, or we can get 
um, you know, different pathological organisms that can really grow and proliferate. Um, so those are just a few of the ways that these disorders start to develop. But generally speaking, it's a very slow, insidious, chronic process. Um, I think more than anything that tied to what we were eating. And so that kind of is a nice segue into our conversation about food intolerances and food allergies. And I think we have to start that conversation first by creating a definition. Um, because that's very, it's, it's very challenging to talk about these things and even creating a definition is not going to be super clear to everyone. But interestingly, people confuse the terms all the time. <clears throat> a food allergy is actually something that is, that is acquired during someone's lifetime. So it's not something we're born with. Um, how we actually get food allergies is this whole intestinal hyperpermeability, leaky gut, all of this degenerative change in the intestinal system basically starts allowing incompletely digested foods to leak into the bloodstream and eventually we develop an immunological reaction to those food particles that are incompletely digested. And that immune reaction, one of the properties of it is what's called an IgE antibody reaction, meaning a very specific type of antibody from our immune system binds up those foods and creates a very acute, immediate inflammatory cascade. So these are your typical people with nut allergies where they'll get hives when they eat nuts or someone who develops, you know, a, th a throat swelling when they eat an avocado or these very acute, immediate reactions that can be life-threatening. The And that's actually relatively rare. It only usually occurs when someone has really chronically had intestinal issues um, advance and develop is when allergies are actually acquired. It does happen in children, but that doesn't mean that those children's healthy guts haven't been very, very deranged in getting there. Um, yeah. That question I was going to ask, you have the issue idea. So let's say I don't have a perfect balance of flora yeah. when I'm pregnant yeah. and then give birth. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually, I, I thought about mentioning that another cause of digestive issues literally can start prenatally, right, by in utero, um, you know, health of mom, but then certainly not path, passing through the vaginal birth canal, a lot of kids are C-section, major issue in starting the gut flare off on the right track. And then the lack of breastfeeding with a lot of kids, major issue with establishing that correct flora. So certainly all of those can play a role, and a lot of the very young children I see were battling some of those predispositions that got set in place even before they were born. Because um. I had in my head that a good kid broke out the clean slate, and I read something randomly in the dentist office the other day or something yeah. in a book that said that if you don't have something good to give, then they yeah. just... Yeah, correct. I mean, so, you know, um, the, the vaginal lining is a mucosal membrane. The balance of the flora in the vaginal tract are reflective of the flora that are in the intestinal tract. So if your intestinal flora a lot of wax or your vaginal flora, and yes, you would pass that on um, in, in a way that can imbalance someone's gut, for sure. Yeah. Um, when I was in my, I grew up on seafood. Okay. And then in my um, 30s, I became allergic to clams and shrimp, but I yeah. didn't eat anything else, yeah. including oysters yeah. and that. Why is it signaling interest to those two? Yeah, well, because again, the way in which the, in an allergy, a true allergy, the way in which the immune system um, derives an allergy response is very what's called antigen specific. So basically, the immune system is IDing those shell, those specific shellfish as potentially harmful and toxic, like a virus or bad bacteria. And so it's triggering this immediate immune cascade to clear and remove that substance. And it just, like we'll talk about in blood type, it is very food specific in how these things develop. I would say that, you know, there's some sort of predisposition, but 
I can't scientifically really give a, a rationale as to why one person would have one develop one allergy and another would develop another. I can say what types of food are generally more allergenic. These foods tend to be things like shellfish, like nuts and seeds, um, like eggs. They have highly, the, the, the properties of the molecules on those foods are highly immunoreactive when they are in completely digested. And that's the big key, right? When they are in completely digested. Because if you have a healthy intestinal lining, if you're completely breaking down those foods, it's almost, you know, it, it's exquisitely uncommon to have a true allergy. I remember the other feature of that allergy is it's immediate in terms of the reaction. Um, the nice thing about that too then, if you follow the logic of it, is that allergies are reversible. I believe and I have seen it happen on many, many occasions. Obviously, the longer an allergy has been in place, the slower that process is, and that's generally true about health. Um, kids heal a lot quicker than elderly, right? Um, the pattern's been there a lot longer, there's a lot less vitality for older individuals, so healing takes longer. But still, I do think most of the time they're reversible. Okay. So, and in you go ahead. You Would you make that same statement about food sensitivity being reversible? Yeah, I'll get there. So, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, how does that um, connect when you say that the GAPS diet for two years and healed your stomach, but you're still a type O, so. Well, we're going to talk about sensitivities. Yeah. Eat milk still, even though you're. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's related to sensitivity. So a food sensitivity or a food intolerance, in my definition of it, is something that is is not acquired but is inherent. From birth, there are certain foods that we don't digest and assimilate um, completely, and or create immunoreactivity in our system. My experience with that is that, generally speaking, that doesn't change. It always has been true and always will be true. And I guess the good or the bad news, depending on how you want to look at that, is that food sensitivities and food intolerances are much more common than food allergies. In fact, we all have food sensitivities and food intolerances. <clears throat> what becomes really challenging for people to kind of wrap their head around that is that when you are eating a food that you are intolerant to all the time, it's very difficult when, when you eat that food to discern the reactivity to it. Part of that is because a lot of the reactivity is delayed. So you could be eating a food that bothers your system in a myriad of ways that you don't actually experience the consequence of that for even 24 hours. Many things we have intolerances or sensitivities to can also be pretty immediate as well. Um, and of course, the state of a healthy intestinal system is all wrapped into all this, right? So it is a bit of a spectrum as, as to know what are you inherently sensitive to versus what are you sensitive to as it relates to having some leaky gut, some dysbiosis, some intestinal maldigestion issues, right? How do you decide, how do you determine that? And largely the, the, the answer to that I'm going to give is it's a very individualized question and it's appreciated most optimally from clinical observation, meaning working with a doctor, like a naturopath like myself, and really being able to discern over the course of treatment what's what. But I'm also going to give you guys a lot of tools to help better understand that as well today. Um, so those sensitivities, like I said, it can be really challenging to wrap your head around because, you know, I might tell you, well, you have a sensitivity or intolerance to wheat. You say, well, I eat wheat all the time and it doesn't you know, bother me, I don't notice it. I mean, okay, but the analogy I would use to that is like a car, when you're driving on the freeway and you're going 70 miles an hour and you speed up to 72 miles an hour, it's basically imperceptible, right? You almost don't notice it. 
Um, that's analogous to you eating wheat all the time on a regular basis, right? It's like you're already really inflamed and you're just measuring inflammation slightly and it's, it's really going to be very poorly appreciated what that individual um, uh, kind of uh, introduction to that food in that moment is going to cause. Now, if you go from 0 to 72 on the freeway, is very obvious, right? So that's what, you know, essentially is the concept of one of the ways to test for food intolerances, which is called elimination challenge. When you've cleared that substance from your system, when you've removed that inflammatory response, then you can very clearly discern if that food is something you're reactive to. Typically, how long that takes to clear out the memory of that food in your system is between four and six weeks. So you could not spend a single dollar in food intolerance or allergy testing and really actually determine through relationship with food exactly what foods you're sensitive to. Now, of course, because the health of the gut changes, some of those sensitivities may be related to a leaky compromised gut, some of those sensitivities may just be intrinsic for you. And over time, you work out, oh, wow, now that I'm feeling so much better, um, I'm going to do a challenge with this food that I was having a problem with. And, oh, it's, that doesn't bother me. Well, great, I must not have a true intolerance to that food. It just must have been a consequence of my leaky gut in my immune system reacting to that incompletely digested food. Yes? In support of what you're saying, Recently, my husband and I did an elimination diet for 30 days. Yeah. And so uh, after 30 days, we brought back some scrambled eggs. Uh, and the first day, we both experienced headaches. Yeah. And then we tried the second, and again, the headaches. So we just realized eggs are something that's not best for us. But on a positive note, mm -hmm. we, uh, he was, what we thought was highly allergic to onions. We discovered he wasn't, and he was fine. Right. And I was thrilled because I loved cooking. Yes. Indeed. So it, it, uh, it's exactly what you're saying. There you go. Thanks for sharing that, Sam. Yeah, yeah. So the intolerances are something that are just a little more extreme than the sensitivity? Yeah, I mean, I guess we could use, you know, if, if we wanted to break that down into different terms so it's less confusing, we could say an intolerance is something that is, you know, lifelong, it's not acquired, it's, it's something that always will be true that you're sensitive to that food. Um, or, or intolerant to that food, sorry. Whereas maybe a sensitivity, we could define a little separately, is in a state of optimal digestive physiology, breakdown and absorption, that that food would be fine when the gut's in a really healthy state. And the way that um, the testing was done decades ago mm -hmm. in the office, was that through something like or some... Yeah, I'm going to mention testing okay. methods, and I'll, I'll mention the what's called Carol food intolerance testing. Okay. That's okay. radionics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Check. So on those cleanses that we do, the juice fasts, yeah. and then you do the reintroduction to food, is that not technically long enough? You know, I, I think because of the juice detox that the class that we teach is so incredibly Intense. um, intensive in terms of removing inflammation from the body, I find it to be enough time to accurately assess food sensitivities and food intolerances. So I feel like it's valid, um, but you would have to do that level of an intensity of a protocol to shorten the duration that you do the challenge. As opposed to just leaving that particular food out for four to six months. Right, correct. And so of course an elimination diet, you take, basically you take the foods that are like most likely to be intolerances or sensitivities, <clears throat> eggs, tomatoes, peanut, soy, wheat, dairy, um, potato, corn, and um, you basically, in an ideal world, start to one by one pull them out of your diet until they're kind of all out, and then one by one um, start to reintroduce them. So it's pretty challenging, right? That's why a lot of people aren't willing to do that. But ultimately, it's the gold standard. It's the best way to totally determine it about what you're reacting to. Is that a list in the papers that you're going to give us? Uh, paper. 
I'm actually not passing out. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm somewhere else then. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and we will have it recorded though, so the, you can totally review. Okay. I think I'll just come visit you afterwards and write it down because I need to start eliminating the stuff right away. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, the actual okay. foods. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so um, and, and I should have added eggs to that list too. That's, that's what is eggs? Eggs. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, my favorite food. Yeah, so um, not to say that anybody is universally intolerant to anything. I don't believe that. However, there are certain foods, like I said, that a large proportion of our population have a reactivity to. And I'm not going to go into this in this lecture because it's too broad sweeping, but what we have done to modify and alter our foods have a profound role to play in this conversation, right? The wheat that we eat today resembles in no way, shape, or form the wheat that our ancestors consumed. The gluten content of the wheat we eat today is thousands of times higher than that of ancient grains. So we heard this term gluten-free. Well, part of why people have so much problem with gluten is we're getting thousands of times more of it than ancestrally we were getting. Okay, so, um, it's, it's not necessarily that inherently wheat is evil or cow dairy is evil. It's just that we've modified the heck out of these foods to the point where most people's systems don't tolerate them. Does organic wheat also have that? Yes, correct. The organic stipulation has very little to do with it. It's the hybridization process and the modification of the actual plant that geneticists and you know commercial... Agra has done over the last 50 years. But European is pretty okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's much better for sure. I'm talking about where we live here in the U.S., which is like, you know, uh, you know wild west of um, food regulation. So, gotcha. Is sprouted grains better? Sprouted grains can be better uh, depending on, you know, the individual. Yeah. Combine ancient grains. Yeah, ancient grains are going to be the best kind of direction to move. Ezekiel, spelt, amaranth, yeah. That's kind of my question. What are your thoughts on einkorn? Yeah, einkorn, for sure, much better. Definitely. Again, you know, those are ancient, right? So they don't have all that hybridization. And we're, we're kind of getting off into a real specific topic. But yeah. I just wanted to bring that point up for people, right, to understand that piece that it's not a lot of people, you know, poo-poo or, you know, are very skeptical of naturopathic physicians or other people who pay attention to these things and say, oh, well, you just universally tell people that that's bad for you. Well, partly because how we've changed some of these foods is pretty much universally bad for us. Okay. Um, and, and I would also say really quickly, the point of what's the issue with these foods, right? They're reacting to our immune system. They're not digesting completely. Well, other than allergies, but intolerances and sensitivities, you could imagine this is a dose and frequency dependent phenomenon. Right? So if you're having a little bit of conventional wheat once a week, you know, a few times a month, it's really going to have a way less detrimental effect on the health of your digestive system mm -hmm. in that relationship to the flora and the immune system than if you're having it every day. So there's a, you know, there's, I tell people about 80-20 rule, right, yeah. in, in relation to how you're eating. It's like, if you're eating really well 80% of the time, for the vast majority of people, you're going to feel pretty great. Um, now, a lot of people find that eating really well beyond 80% of the time is worth it to them because they don't want to feel the crappiness of eating a food they're intolerant to. Right? But, but I, I don't think it has to be this thing where you're like, well, I can never eat uh, cow cheese again. No, but I mean, you can really de-emphasize it as a staple. Yeah, I would say the most common things are certainly intestinally mediated, so bloat, gas, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, those are very common. Um, fatigue shows up in kids, they can get really hyperactive, mood-wise they can go really bouncy and <laughs> awry. Um, you know, really common headaches, joint pain, uh, skin reactions, rashes, Sinus congestion, um, to name a few. Yeah, those would be a good starting point. Yeah. So, 
Um, so are we clear, just before we move on to testing, how to differentiate allergies, intolerances, and sensitivities? Does that make sense? Okay. And this is my definition. You could talk to another doctor and they may have a totally different way of looking at it, but that's how I kind of categorize and perceive things. So in that context, let's talk about, other than the elimination challenge, how to test for these things, how to determine that for yourself or your family. So, speaking to allergy, obviously the main way to scientifically determine that is to do what's called an IgE blood test. That's the antibody that does that immediate acute reaction. You can measure that in someone's blood. You can also actually do skin testing. And if someone had asked, you know, environmental versus food allergy, the skin testing can actually measure food allergies because you can bleb out, your immune system can react to that food antigen in your skin, but it can also be done for environmental things. And to kind of finish this thought, um, environmental versus food allergy, my experience with environmental allergies, they're a consequence of an already inflamed immune system that's already lost its intelligence and it's reacting to things that are benign in, in the environment. So my experience and success with that is heal, treat the gut, the food, intent, food sensitivities and tolerances, repair the intestinal lining, rebalance the immune system, and the environmental sensitivities, the seasonal allergies, the hay fever all go away. Um, but that's a process and it often can take a full year of actively working on that to achieve that. So if you come to me in the middle of, you know, seasonal allergies and say, hey, cure this, we're probably not going to cure it right then. We may be able to address the symptoms and start to work on the underlying cause. That's just to kind of catch that, that question. Um, so other testing methods, that's how we test allergies. Pretty straightforward. Sadly and unfortunately, in the realm of conventional medicine, medical doctors, nurse practitioners, osteopaths, PAs, whatever, if you go to see a doctor and you want to talk about food allergies, sensitivities, and tolerances, that is the only thing you will be offered in terms of a testing methodology. That's unfortunate because 99 plus percent of the adverse effects we have from the food we eat are not allergies. So that's not going to tell us much. It's again only in a very pathological advanced state that those things actually show up. Yes, Jay. Jay. Oh, oh, dude, you just called me khaki. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Both Jays. Um, so I've heard that you can make a paste out of the food with water and then put it on your like wrist overnight and see yeah. like, the thread is that. That would be one methodology. You can actually take a, a drop of the food stuff um, and someone with a true um, intolerance to that food will actually develop a red mark where that food had dried out. Intolerance um, or allergy? Uh, I think I think it's an intolerance, or it could be an allergy too. I mean, usually though, with an allergy, again, it's more of an acute reaction, the symptom. So generally, we're looking at intolerances there, or sensitivities. Um, so now there's other types of antibodies that we can test for, and these other antibodies are much more um, directive about intolerances and sensitivities and they are called IgG and IgA antibodies. They're also done with blood, and they're done with specialty labs. We do them at our clinic. Um, what they're really valuable for is at least partially helping us discern what we are currently eating in our diet that we're reacting to. We only develop IgA and IgG antibodies in high concentrations when we are consuming a food that our immune system is reacting to. Okay, so you may have a real intolerance to wheat, but you're not eating wheat. And if it doesn't show up on your um, IgG or IgA blood test, it doesn't mean that it's not a problem for you. So that test is a snapshot into what you're currently eating and some of the things that you could possibly be reacting to. So there's some limitation to that in that that's very changeable, right, both in what you're eating 
as well as what you're reacting to. So it can involve, you know, retesting to really discern how that's changing. It's a pretty expensive test. The cheapest one is about two hundred dollars. The more comprehensive ones are around three hundred. So they're not cheap tests. Um, certainly compared to an elimination challenge, right? But at least it can get you in the ballpark without doing the hard work of elimination challenge of seeing some of the things you're reacting to. I also find clinically that certain foods are predisposed, the ones that are more antigenic, to reacting on those tests. For example, I've never tested someone, I've maybe a couple people, who didn't show reactive to eggs. Clearly not everyone is reactive to eggs. I think the eggs are highly reactive to the immune system. So some, so everyone's going to show some degree of reactivity. When it's really, really high, I'm usually more discerning about maybe we should take a break of eggs for a while while we heal the gut line. And when we re-challenge them, they, they'll probably do fine. Yeah. How reliable is kinesiology? Yeah, I'll mention that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, in that context, I'm in a current real challenge around getting them protein. And okay. so the egg thing, yeah. long story short, um, one of the recent things I've heard is that it's part of the reason of the difficulty is there's too much complexity in it for us. Yeah. So. yeah, and I mean eggs, there's a lot to eggs. The quality of eggs is a big deal. Organic um, from your neighbor's farm versus the horrible way in which conventional yeah, eggs are created. Those. Yeah, so fresh, high quality eggs are a big deal. Um, how we, a lot of people are sensitive to either the white or the yolk, so it's good to, to break those out. Um, how the white and the yolk are prepared, both individually and then how they're mixed, has a relationship with how they do in the gut. So eggs are a complicated thing to talk about in terms of how they associate with digestion. But I just wanted to bring up the egg thing because maybe some of you guys have done this IgG, IgA thing. and. Oh, well, eggs showed up, so I'm never ever supposed to eat eggs again. I don't think that's true for the vast majority of people. Yeah, Mike. So I had, I had one of these IG tests done, and the nurse practitioner called me back and said, Wow, you're like, you're intolerant or allergic or, or whatever to a whole bunch of things. Yeah, great, great, and I went great thing to bring a specialist, and they took a different test. Yeah. And she found no smoking gun, but I kept getting sick. So cool. I went back to the original test, and I just quit eating eggs. Right. Yeah, and, and I think those can be very valid. I mean, don't get me wrong, right? Those, those IgG, IgAs can be very helpful in discerning what you're currently reacting to and getting it out of the system for a while can help things restabilize. But in answer to your question of why, it's a perfect example. You were highly reactive to a lot of things. What that really tells me in that test is you have a leaky gut. And so you're leaking a bunch of incompletely digested foods into your bloodstream and they're reacting to the immune system. But my symptom was something that you didn't mention. I was getting fevers. Okay. Nasty, high fever. Yeah, and, and the symptoms I mentioned are maybe a dozen out of hundreds okay. that could be potential um, attributions to relationship with food. Understand that 80% of your immune system lives in your gut. Okay, so if your gut's not in good shape, there are going to be consequences immunologically, and most of the symptoms we experience in health are really mediated by our immune system. So again, it's why I made the statement at the beginning of the, vit, the chat, the gut is the seat of health. That's one of the reasons, right? Because most of our immune system is governed and directed by its interplay with the gut and the bugs that are in our gut. So in answer to that, when you go and heal the gut, those, those tests can look very, very different. Those reactivities can subside dramatically. Yes? Are there multiple ways to heal the gut, or is it just yes. diet for two years? No, infinite ways. Oh, I love that answer. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me talk about a few other testing methodologies, unless there are other questions around the IgG, IgA food intolerances. Sorry, I, I didn't hear her question, but I think she referred to the GAPS protocol. Yeah, she asked, are there other ways other than GAPS to heal your gut? Okay, and I said, infinite ways. Okay, yeah. um, so, so the IgG and IgA um, are only available through physicians. Unfortunately, you can't just go off and get that test on your own. They're a chunk of change. So again, I always feel that 
we should decide if it's clinically relevant to test them first and foremost. There's a lot of ways to clinically determine what you're reacting to just by, oftentimes people will just come in and tell me, yeah, when I eat um, wheat, I get bloated. When I um, have dairy, I get mucusy. I mean, a lot of it's very obvious and we somehow practice avoidance or disbelief around some of these things because we don't want it to be true. Uh, but that's a really simply put way to determine some of those too. There are other methodologies. Um, someone met mentioned muscle testing or kinesiology. This is a method by which you place the food in your hand or some derivative of that food and you press on a muscle. Um, someone very trained to do this, right? And if it goes weak, that food's a problem. If it stays strong, it's not. Um, there's a lot of training involved in that. I'm not going to comment on its validity, whether or not it works. I see that it works very well for some practitioners. I will say that I do not utilize it, and the reason I don't utilize it is because I don't find it to be reproducible. And as a scientist and a physician, I, I find reproducibility really critical in, um, in making health decisions. And, you know, I, I just, again, if that's just why it's not a, a method that I'm using, and I feel like it would take a long time to hone that skill. And I have so many areas I want to put my energy and attention in developing expertise, that's not one of them. But that is a method that can be used. Um, there's also more electrical methods. Um, there's uh, what's called EAV, and I'm forgetting the acronym for that. There's, there's different electrical machines, basically, that can measure impedance of when you're holding a food and how that food reacts to your system. Um, again, the science of that is not very well established. And I've also found the re reproducibility to be really challenging with that, which is why I don't utilize it. Um, and then another option that <coughs> Pam was directly asking about food intolerance testing, Carol food intolerance testing. This is a, a radionics machine, which is at one point banned in the United States, and there's a lot of kind of witch hunting around it, but it basically, a, a real famous doctor from Spokane pioneered this, and um, many of my patients will come in with that testing methodology. There's a couple of nature paths in Spokane that utilize it. Um, again, reproducibility uh, is an issue, in my opinion, with that testing methodology, because ultimately, how can you remove bias of the practitioner? when the practitioner is actually the one engaging the person's muscle or the person's blood yeah. in determining what the intolerance or sensitivity is. So that's my issue. But those are you know methods, and I don't want to say they're flatly wrong, because I've seen people where it works amazingly for them um, with many of their patients, and patients get good results. So who am I to deny that's not a valid tool for them? Um, outside of all of those things, I want to kind of end in terms of methodologies of assessment on some genetic components. And really specifically, I want to draw our attention towards blood type. Um, and there's a question I'll answer in relation to that around the validity of blood type, the science of it. Um, blood type and nutrition or blood type and food sensitivities or intolerances has actually been around for over a hundred years. A lot of people don't know that. They know about the popularized book by a colleague of mine, Dr. Diadamo, who wrote Eat Right for Your Type. Yeah. And a lot of the you know popularization of that in mainstream health comes from that. <clears throat> the premise of the blood type diet <clears throat> is that our blood group has a um, a role to play in determining genetically which enzymes we produce um, on a very specific basis to different foods. So for example, if you don't make an enzyme for a banana, you're not going to digest that efficiently and it's going to lead to eventually all of the downstream intestinal consequences and bloodstream consequences of not completely digesting that food doesn't make banana a bad food, it just makes it a food that you don't have an enzyme for. Secondarily, and the science of blood type in relation to food 
is that every single food we consume carries very unique antigens or, or molecular signatures that are unique to that food. And it turns out that our immune system identifies, IDs these antigens, they're called lectins, I identifies these lectins on a very specific basis, and it turns out on a very blood type specific basis. So there are people who have exclusively used lectins just in their own right to determine which foods to eat. Foods that are higher in lectins, they say avoid altogether. I think the science is more precise. I think that it's how those lectins in those foods react to individuals based off of what their blood type is. So if you're an A blood type, um, your immune system looks at the lectin on lentils as something that's friendly and you know easily assimilated. It's, it's not hostile and it doesn't mount an immune response to it. If you're a B blood type, the immune system of someone with that blood type looks at those lectins on the lentil and sees it as hostile, harmful, it triggers an inflammatory cascade. And there's physiological consequences that come from that. Um, and so we can very specifically and scientifically go and look at those relationships and reactivities. And so it's funny to me when people talk about how the blood type diet has no scientific basis because of all of the diets that exist, the only diet that I know of it has a concrete genetic scientific basis is the blood type diet. All of the rest are fads and you know keto diet is the big fad now and you know before is paleo diet and you know these have nothing to do with specificity of food on an individual basis. Um, they're just generally about what foods are healthy or not on a one-size-fits-all model. Okay, yeah, so the question was, the criticism is that the blood type diet is based on one scientist uh, who did it in very poor um, scientific um, kind of uh, setting. Yeah, and, and that it, it's not valid because of that. You know, I have actually met that guy. He's actually the, like, probably one of the greatest geniuses I've ever met. So he does profound amounts of scientific research. He posts literally hundreds of scientific studies on a daily basis. And so that's kind of preposterous to me because the science is very robust. And it's been done for, like I said, over 100 years. You can go look at immunology textbooks and they'll talk about lectins and blood type and food mediation through blood type. It's, it's, it's not new. Okay. When we're talking about lectins, in my head, I get like a picture of like, um, like a like a three-prong plug plugging into something else? Is it kind of like each food has a different shape of prong that plugs into your blood differently? Right, yeah. Each food has a different signature molecularly, and that kind of relates to your immunological system in a different way. Either in a tolerant, friendly response, great, this thing is food, this thing is medicine, don't mess with it, or this thing is hostile, this thing shouldn't be here, let's generate an inflammatory response to remove it. All right, so based on that, we know some very specific things about each blood type. And if you wanted me to dispense a blood type list, I'd be happily willing to share that via email. There's also books that can share that. Um, but basically, you go through it and, you know, what you're responsive to, inflammatory, you minimize, and what is friendly, you promote. Um, now, one person, I think one argument that has some validity is, Overall, it, all of the blood types, if you eat in relation to them, they're a much more healthy diet than the standard American diet. It's true, okay? I'm not going to argue with that. So I could say that some of my patients feel better just because they're eating overall a healthier whole foods diet. And I'm not too, you know, I'm not too devastated that that might be part of what makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I have seen clinically with I've worked with thousands of patients that some of these very unique properties, like B blood types, don't digest chicken well. And 
what's wrong with chicken? Well, B blood types, I, I mean, always, I find turkey, fine, but chicken, wow, that's awful. I mean, and that, wouldn't that be so weird if there was nothing to that? It was just like, oh, you know, chicken is universally unhealthy or is universally healthy. Well, no, actually, it turns out that some people react really strongly to that. It happens to be that B blood types and AB blood types really don't do well with it. And there's many other, you know, thousands of other clinical examples, or I should say hundreds, where people come to me and say, yeah, that specific food, I re-challenged that a month later and it really bothered me. I mean, something like an avocado or a tomato, right? Tomatoes are pretty allergenic, maybe a better example. Or lentils, right? Or black beans or uh, peanuts or cashews. I mean, things that we intrinsically see as healthy foods causing reactivities, bananas, oranges. Um, so, so that is kind of a distillation of the blood type in a very general principle. And I find it to be very clinically useful in my practice as a starting point for people. I also find that um, it's, it's very accessible and doable. You know, somebody might have to cut out some pretty major staples or minimize major staples, but it's sustainable and doable, right? Something like, you know, the GAPS diet, which I'll mention in a minute, is pretty limiting. It totally takes out all grains and all beans and all lactose, you know, fermentable carbohydrate. It's a hard diet to follow, especially long term. You know, what goes with that with blood type is that's truly a lifelong design thing, right? It's always going to be true because it's, a, it's, a, it's an intolerance, okay? So, nevertheless, I find that my, especially my established patients that I have a long term relationship with, you know, they're thrilled to know what they're sensitive to and, you know, basically care for their body based on that knowledge because when they don't utilize that knowledge and stray away from it, they don't feel well on many different planes of existence. And so it, over time, it becomes an increasingly easy choice to make, right? I mean, I still think for myself, like if you could tell me, what if you, right now, if you could just eat anything you wanted, don't worry about the consequences, that doesn't matter, what would you have? I would probably say pizza, I love pizza. Yeah. But again, as an A blood type, it has wheat, cow dairy, and tomato as its main three ingredients. Three things that I'm highly intolerant to and will make me feel absolutely awful if I actually ate them. So over time, it's really become an easy choice, even if it's right in front of me. Yeah, I'm not, not going to eat that food because of how it's going to make me feel. Yeah. Of course, for some people, they might not be in that place. The joy of, you know, living to eat is more important to a lot of people over how the food they eat makes them feel. Yeah. And I, that's valid. I'm, I'm okay with <laughs> that being someone's truth. In the end, it's going to create a lot of suffering for that person and really shorten their longevity. Um, but it's, it's a valid choice to make for someone. Yeah? Is the, um, the science that exists for the blood type diet intrinsic also in the genotype? Yeah, so I wanted to just make a quick statement about the genotype, which is a it's, it's a much more comprehensive genetic understanding of, of specificity of foods. So it's, it's more precise than the blood type. And it incorporates the secretor information, which has all sorts of research about it in terms of how that relates to food and health. So that's another genetic component that goes into the genotype. It's essentially, the genotype is a much more individualized understanding of relationship with food and beyond food into, you know, movement propensity, aging propensity, immune propensities, um, stress profiles, right? We can learn a ton. Disease vulnerabilities. So that process involves knowing the blood type, knowing the secretor status, which is another genetic test. It's one we do at the clinic and send off for. It's a cheek swab. And then it's actually sitting down in doing a whole host of measurements, um, leg length, tooth shape, <coughs> fingerprint design, um, jaw shape, uh, width and diameter of the head, iris architecture, family history, personal history, laboratory history, personality tests. <coughs> All of this information gets amalgamated into a, into a, a really sophisticated software program that essentially publishes a book about it. So, 
Um, it's you know it's 50, 60 pages. It's it's really like a book, and it's you know to me the pinnacle of individualized nutrition and health understanding. But does it have the same kind of testing about like lectins and so forth? It utilizes that information and it layers on top of it <laughs> other more also scientifically based information that allows us to get a little more precise about things. Yes. Is the IG test a precursor to that? Test? Is the what? The IG. The IgG is completely separately related, right? That's just that immune reactivity to the foods you're currently eating and doing a blood test on that. So is this genotype test going to give you that same kind of information? I wouldn't call it the same kind because it's coming from a completely different perspective. Right, so what today's lecture is about is laying out all that's out there, and I'm kind of culminating with talking about what I use and why. Um, but by no means is that right or wrong, it's just what I have found to be really effective and what I find the science is really valid for. I guess what I, because you and I talked about the genotype last yeah. time, I was an office. Right. So when would you recommend the genotype to someone uh, versus yeah. recommending yeah. The, the blood type? The IgG. Well, the IgG is when we're really stumped and we've done a lot of things to try to heal the gut, you know, utilize knowledge about the forces <laughs> at play, and we're still not getting anywhere. Um, I, I run about, you know, a hand maybe about a dozen of those tests a year. And most of the time it's at the request of patients who are just insisting that they want to have it done. Um, I very rarely find it clinically that helpful to me. Some of my colleagues use it all the time and they find it very helpful. So I'm not saying it's not helpful, just for my own practice. Um, the genotype, on the other hand, is much more precise. There's a bit of a cost to that. It costs around $350 to do the entire process. but I really like the genotype for people who are really engaged in wanting to be incredibly participatory in optimizing their health. Right? They want as much as possible to know about themselves and their design so that they can apply that knowledge and not just um, stave off disease but build health. So I typically introduce the genotype to my established patients who I can tell are very sincerely interested in going down the rabbit hole of their health and having as much knowledge as possible to um, optimize their genetic expression and their, you know, their vitality and ultimately their longevity. That's what I use it for most. Yeah. You mentioned the MTHFR gene. Yes. I'm wondering how that fits in, or the biochemistry fits into this genotype profiling thing. Uh, there's, there's, no, um, there's no other SNPs that are measured to oh. look at the genotyping. It's just the secretor status. Oh. Because of how big of a role the secretor genetically actually does play in relation to food. I don't know what the secretor is. Can you explain that? Yeah, secretor is FUT2. It's a gene on a chromosome that has mm -hmm. incredibly diverse health implications. Mm -hmm. It has a lot, the, the basic premise of it, on a real distilled down level, like simplified level, is whether or not you secrete your blood group, um, meaning your, your blood group antigens, into your saliva, vaginal secretions, tears, intestinal lining. Um, that's one very limited aspect of it, and it tells us a lot about immunologically how robust your immune system can be. Non-secretors, which are about 15% of people, are a lot more, more vulnerable to immune-mediated disease, and those diseases can go very quickly to a life-threatening state for non-secretors. Uh, but there's thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of articles about the relationship between secretor status and health. So it's it's wide-ranging, much like you know the the methylation stuff, right? right. It's it's so diverse. We don't know everything there is to know about it. We never will. But that's one of the things that's really useful. How do you test for that? It's a it's a it's a cheek swap. How much is it? It's around a hundred bucks to do the test. Only one lab in the country does it. It'd be great if it's cheaper, but that's what it is. So, so does it um, if like one person is that like in the family? Would... If if both people if both parents <coughs> are secretors in the family, then all kids and are going to be. Blood type? Well, the secretor is a totally separate thing, right? So you use both sets of information to determine the genotype. 
Yeah, yeah, so both are the same, then yes. Uh, yeah. And same thing with blood type. If, I mean, so the thing about blood type is you have two components to it. You have one from dad and one from mom. So with O blood type, if both mom and dad are O, you can guarantee the children are O. Because those are both, they, it's, a, it's called a, a double recessive. O is always recessive to the A or the B. But if you're an A blood type or a B blood type, you could have an A from one side and an O from the other side, and that makes you an A, because the A is dominant. So if both parents are not O's, ultimately the offspring would need to be tested to be definitive about what their blood type is. Negative or positive doesn't Negative and positive isn't quite as important for our purposes in relating to food. Yeah. And it's really easy to test it. You know, the, the test is like 10 bucks to get online. You just get it on Amazon. You prick the end of your finger and rub it on a few windows and you know instantly what your blood type is. Um, so it's really easy access to learn that information. Um, a lot of times I'll just type people right in the clinic because a lot of people come in without knowing it. And then I explain in a condensed form what I explain to you guys about the relationship. And if people are skeptical, I say, well, would you be willing to work on this for a month? See how it goes, and you know, don't take my word for it. Um, you know, rechallenge some of those foods. And see, see how you feel. And I'm not, you know, married to them avoiding it just because it shows up on their avoid list, right? The blood type information is not exquisitely specific and individualized. There's still some variability within it. Yes. Does it become difficult with meal planning when there's various blood types? <laughs> you know, some people will make that. Some people will make that criticism. Honestly, the hardest combo there is, in my opinion, is the A B combo, A and B, which is what my wife and I are. Um, all the other ones, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of overlap too. And generally, what a healthy diet is defined as is a lot of whole fruits, a lot of whole vegetables, whole vegetables especially. Um, reasonable amounts of lean, clean proteins from both animal and plant sources, whether that's beans or actual meat, and um, healthy oils and healthy nuts and seeds. So when you look at all the blood types collectively, the lists of what you can have are way, way, way larger than the list of what you can't have. Um, and so there are some places either where there's a little partitioning or um, you de-emphasize certain foods, even though one blood type's okay to do that, you know, beef, but the other blood type's not. Okay, well, the household doesn't eat a ton of beef. But maybe on occasion you do, and you have another protein, or maybe that's an occasion where the person with the A blood type who shouldn't eat beef has a little bit of beef, and as long as it's on occasion, it's not a big deal. So I do think it's very doable in, with different blood types in a household. I had one patient or one family with adoptive children where they had all four. That gets a little crazy, but that's exquisitely rare. Usually at most you're dealing with two. Um, and that's usually pretty doable. Yeah. You mentioned the genotyping and the testing Yes. And it compiles into a book. Yes. Is that what Swami is? Yes. It's about Swami. So the Swami. book of answers is Swami. Yes, yeah, Swami is the software platform that creates it. Yes. Yeah. Would it be an oversimplification to say that the secretor testing is an indication of immunity strength? No, it's not an over. It, I mean, it's oversimplified in that the secretor tells us a lot more than that. But one of the most valuable clinical purposes of it is to understand immunologically if there's vulnerability there. In people with really chronic immune immune insufficiency, I will often be very curious about their secretor status because of that. Yeah. Okay. Are we good on blood type and genotype and kind of concepts around that? Yeah. Who wrote the book uh, uh, on blood the, the popularized book is... Well, the one that you recommend. Yeah, is the popularized book is Dr. Peter Diadamo. And if you look up each right for your type, it, I mean, it's right out here in the store. You can pick it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so he'll, he'll, you know, distill that down in layman's terms, kind of some of what I just shared. And he'll talk about 
where the blood types evolve from and how that relates. The science of that is a little less concrete. That's why I didn't bring it up tonight that, you know, we eat based on the region of the world we evolve from and where that blood type originated. Science of that is, is a little less solid. Um, but that will be part of what the blood type book explains to. There's a lot about, there's a lot of groups on Facebook Right. Yeah. And again, for me personally, like, that doesn't resonate quite as much just because it's not quite as directly science-based. We don't have a lot of direct evidence of that. So I don't emphasize that when I determine what I think is why this is so effective for people. No, but they have lots of um, resources and, like, cooking and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's tons of resources on Diodama's website about, you know, you know, recipes, yeah, and, I mean, tons, yeah, and I refer people toward that, and I give a lot of people resources through our clinic as well. And Dr. there's a phone app? Is there, a there is a phone app, it's three ninety nine. dollars yep, just put it right on your phone, and if you're shopping, just look at it. Yeah, that would, I would assume it would be more updated than a printed book. It would be, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's regularly updated. Sure. Um, the whole Dr. Gundry and the uh, Instapot. Uh, yeah, removing the lectins. lectins. Yeah. Is that? Possible? Yeah, it does. I mean, those remove the lectins for the most part. Instapot is a pressure cooker, mm -hmm. so it uh, it pulls beans, particularly got a lot of lectins on them, so you can boil off those lectins pretty well in there. Mm -hmm. In my experience, that still doesn't negate the real specific immune reaction yeah. conferred by blood type. Um, I've definitely had patients report to me that, yeah, that still doesn't change the fact that lentils make me super gassy and bloated or, or something. But, it, but I think it helps strip a lot of those lectins off. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ready to move on to the, kind of the wrap-up? Okay. So we're going to have to really abbreviate this because we're already over. But I already kind of talked about, you know, approaches to gut healing, to addressing food intolerances. We kind of embedded that, right? If you're going to use the IgG, IgA, you're going to avoid those foods for a period of time. If you're going to use the blood type, you're going to follow that guidance. Um, in my experience, the vast majority of people will do better once they just do that and, and be in a pretty optimized state of digestion. However, there is a subset of people that have very degenerated gut health that we need to do a little more emphasis or more therapeutic diets. And Jamie mentioned something called GAPS diet. That's one I really like to utilize because it's a really awesome diet at healing that intestinal lining and reorganizing the gut flora. The, the concept of it is that you remove fermentable carbohydrates from the diet. Fermentable means that your gut flora can feed on them. And usually what that does is it starves out the bad bugs and allows the good bugs to repopulate. And those fermentable carbohydrates, often which are processed foods and sugars and lactose and wheat, all those things, are really irritating to the intestinal lining. And once you get that irritation off of there, the intestinal system is allowed to heal. Um, I often will really promote the other element of that specific carbohydrate diet, which is really promoting bone broths because Bone broths are full of constituents that are really um, enriching and healing to the intestinal lining. Um, it, and it's a very, you know, food-based way to repair the, the gut. So um, often that will be a, a therapeutic diet for these people who have pretty advanced intestinal issues that we need to go above and beyond just the blood type information because that is, is not going to fully bring about healing. Yeah, I would, I would generally, it would be a very, very rare case that I would prescribe a GAPS diet during breastfeeding or pregnancy. It would need to be a pretty, you know, significant imbalance that was really creating major problems. The thing about waiting until it's stop breastfeeding, so I was yeah. about that. Sure, yeah, probably be a good idea. And then bone broth is okay for babies? Yeah, of course, yeah, bone broth anybody can use, regardless of whether or not you're using the GAPS diet. But an important component of the GAPS diet is using bone broth. 
And of course, there are introductory phases to this diet for people who are really, really sick. You start off almost exclusively being able to eat bone broth and gradually build from that as your gut heals. Um, or you can just put the full GAPS diet in place, which is still very challenging, but ultimately some people do really well just with that. Unless it's chicken in your B type. Yeah, so a lot of times I'll overlay the blood type information. But again, it's, we don't need to go too deep into that. Um, however, some people can really benefit from GAPS. Obviously, there's another conversation to be had about, well, what about probiotics? What about gut healing herbs? What about gut healing um, formulas? Uh, what about um, antimicrobial herbs, things that kill the bad bugs? Yes, all of those are relevant, and all of those have a place in healing the gut, and therefore resolving food sensitivities. Um, I didn't want to make that quite as big of an emphasis today because I really want the focus to be around how do we discern how our body reacts to foods on an individual basis. But all of those things can be very useful in repairing the integrity of digestion and the gut and therefore allowing us more breadth of what we can break down and assimilate more efficiently. And I would add to that when we were talking about poor digestive output, right, um, poor innervation and blood flow, one of the stopgap measures you can utilize if that's the case is supplying someone with different enzymes to replace function of the stomach or the pancreas or the gallbladder. So you can actually take digestive enzymes and sometimes that can make a real difference. Hopefully that's transient and temporary while you're getting to the root issues. Um, I very seldom find that I, if we're really getting to the root cause, someone needs to stay on a lot of gut focused medicines. Um, probiotics are usually, you know, generally the case, and that's only because some people are like, yeah, I don't want to eat fermented foods on a regular basis. Okay, well, we should probably do a probiotic just to keep the flora balanced and informed correctly. So if you're type A, do you have to continually take the probiotics? No, there's other fermented foods you can eat besides fermented uh, cabbage. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can ferment your own foods, too. Um, and Without vinegar. Yes, you can, with salt. So and even with here. using a little vinegar, it's not going to be a huge issue. Yeah. Yeah, dose and frequency dependent. So if you're guzzling vinegar, I mean, that's different. Yeah. Do you have a list of antimicrobial herbs and gut healing foods anywhere? Um, there's many of them. I like berberine. I like garlic or allicin. Um, I like wormwood. I like barberry. Those are just a few. Barberry, I like oregano extract. So those can be some that are considered. Are they safe for kids or kind of? I would definitely better? consult the healthcare provider to okay. use those. Yeah. Okay, so I feel like I hit all the big stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, I want to leave some time to go over this, and I want to leave some time for closing questions. But I also want to respect everyone's time, and so. Um, I'll stick around after we go through these two to connect if you have individual questions for me. Otherwise, if, if you want to scoot, you're welcome to. Um, and if you want to connect with me in the future, learn more about the clinic, I welcome it. Um, so we do have some info about us in the back. So if anyone needs to take off now, feel free to. Otherwise, um, I'll take closing questions and then go through our, our list here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good indications of like how can you gauge if your gut health is really good? Is it like because you don't get stomach aches? Because you poop five times a day? Cause you, like, <laughs> yeah, like what's what are like the good like how do you know if your gut is in good shape? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a hard thing. I mean, there's a lot of parameters, right? Like you know, obviously understanding the quality of your bowel movements, um, both in shape, consistency, frequency is something to look at. Obviously discerning, you know, how you feel when you consume food and, you know, actual digestive symptoms, bloating, gas, discomfort, fullness, you know, heartburn, some of these other things. Um, I always ask about those types of things that are more obvious, but the challenge is that you could have digestive issues that don't manifest in directly digestively associated symptoms. And sometimes it's really hard to spend the time to like 
get into talking about someone's poop with them in detail. And they're like, well, I don't even look at it, right? So a lot of times it's limiting to know everything you can know to really hone in on it. Um, oftentimes, so there are, it, it, it ends up being, you know, a clinical trial and error based on making adjustments and seeing how the person responds to that. But in general, if you're like pretty good with most digestive stuff and everything else, you can figure that you're pretty good. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a it's a broad sweeping question, right? It's such an individualized question. But yeah, I would think generally, if you know, if you're all of those parameters are in alignment, it's probably not a huge issue for you. But it still may be contributory towards your health issues. Just not maybe to a degree that's as obvious as maybe it is for someone else. So are you saying that I could be eating the right foods and my gut could be okay, but if I'm really stressed, then I could still have those symptoms and problems? Yeah, absolutely. That's All the time it happens. That's yeah. really sad to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I have I have several patients who, you know, have been incredibly studious about implementing changes and optimizing the state of their um, nutrition and you know major intestinal issues still persist and you know we get into very in-depth conversations about what the root cause is there and okay yeah and that's and understandably in a culture and society where stress mediated illness is epidemic obviously that's a huge force with all of this and so that was my big disclaimer right is that Regardless of how much we can learn about the relationship with food, that's with every single person some, something to understand. And if it's a real dysfunctional 